morning and good morning. Welcome to our service here at Plains Park or welcome online if you're worshiping with us online. We, it is good to gather as the body of Christ. For just as the Trinity exists in communion with one another, we also were created to be in communion with each other and with God. Many of us are in the midst of transitions at this time of year as a new school year begins and the seasons start shifting from summer into fall. There are cooler mornings and evenings and with these transitions come many feelings. Feelings of excitement over the new possibilities and trepidation of the unknown. Our gathering this morning is a response to God's call to us. We, like Abraham and Moses, like Peter and Paul, have been called to worship the Lord. We bring our full selves, the parts of us that have drawn near to Christ and followed in his footsteps, and the parts of us that we wish we could bury and pretend didn't exist. Hear these words from Psalm 100 as our prayer this morning. Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with celebration. Come before him with shouts of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He made us, we belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his own pasture. Enter his gates with thanks. Enter his courtyards with praise. Thank him, bless his name. Because the Lord is good, his loyal love lasts forever. His faithfulness lasts generation after generation. Amen. As the worship team comes to join me, I invite you to also stand if you feel comfortable and join us as we sing, The Lord is My Light. This is in Sing the Journey, and we will um, yeah, we'll sing and worship together.
at this time. Jim, if you'd like to come and share with us a word for our children and for the rest of us. Sometimes it's hard to say I'm sorry. Sometimes it's hard to ask to accept an apology. So I have a story to read. It's called The Forgiving Tree, one of the Bernstein Bear books. It was a peaceful day in a tree house down a sunny dirt road deep in bear country. It was Brother Bear's birthday. Happy birthday, brother, shouted the party guests as Mama brought in the cake. Then they all sang the birthday song. Make a wish, said sister. Brother closed his eyes, made a wish, and blew out the candles. Yay, the guests yelled, clapping and blowing on noisemakers. Papa cut the cake and everyone dug in. What did you wish for, said Cousin Fred. If I tell you, it won't come true. When they were finished eating the cake, it was time to open presents. Brother got some very nice ones, a model plane, some books, and a racing car set. Then he noticed Papa sneaking out and he came back in with a brand new bicycle. Wow, said brother excitedly, it's exactly what I wished for. Luckily you didn't tell us, said sister. That's a beautiful bike, said Fred admiring it. I wish I had a bike like that. Oh, said brother without thinking, you can borrow it any time you like. Thanks, said Fred. Let's try out some of your games. All the cubs crowded around brother while they played some games, but they didn't even notice that Fred had taken the bike outside. Hey, said brother, where's my new bike? Say, said Lizzie, looking out the window, isn't that Fred riding it? Lizzie was right. Cousin Fred was outside riding brother's brand new bike around the treehouse. Brother was furious. That Fred growled brother, he can't do that, and he charged outside. Uh-oh, said Mama and Papa Bear, but they were too late. Brother was already chasing Fred around the treehouse, yelling for him to get off the bike. He startled Fred so much that poor Fred didn't look where he was going and ran right into the mailbox. He wasn't hurt, but the bike was. The front wheel was bent and wouldn't turn. Look what you did, shouted brother. Who said you could ride my new bike? You did, said Fred. You said I could borrow it any time. I didn't mean right away, said brother, stamping his feet. I never even got to ride it. Now, brother, said mama, calm down. This is just a misunderstanding. Fred didn't mean any harm. But my bike is ruined, said brother. Just look at it. It's not ruined, said Papa. We'll take it down to the bike shop and get it fixed up as good as new. But it won't be new, said brother. It will never be brand new again. And he stormed off in a huff. I'm sorry, said Fred. He felt awful. I never meant to hurt brother or his new bike. Of course not, Fred, sued Mama. It was just an accident. I'm sorry brother's so mad, said Fred. Do you think he'll ever forgive me again? Of course he will, said Papa. He will get over it in no time. But sister wasn't so sure. She followed brother to their backyard treehouse. Mind if I come up, she called. Brother didn't answer. Sister climbed the ladder and found brother sitting, sulking at the top. Well, you're certainly in a good mood, she said. Hmm, grunted brother. Sister noticed a faded red line drawn down the middle of the treehouse floor. 
As brother and sister sat in their treehouse, it became cloudy and started to rain. They went back to the party and found the guests getting ready to break the pinata. It was one Papa had made in his workshop. There were all kinds of candies inside, but especially licorice, because licorice was Papa's favorite. Papa held the pinata out in a broomstick. Okay, he said, start swinging, but don't hit me. One after another, the cubs whacked the pinata and it finally broke open, spilling candy onto the floor. They all scrambled to grab some, including Papa. Brother scrambled right into Fred. In fact, they knocked heads. Ow, said Fred, rubbing his nuggin. Oops, sorry, said Brother. That's okay, Brother, said Fred. I forgive you. I forgive you too, Fred, said Brother, feeling ashamed of himself. I shouldn't have yelled at you about the bike. It really was just an accident. It's okay, said Fred, and they forgot it as they gathered up the candy. You know, said Papa to Mama as they watched the happy cubs, that old tree in the backyard has seen a lot of forgiving over the years. I guess you would call it a forgiving tree. Well, I think that's very nice of God, said Sister. Yes, agreed Mama and Papa, it sure is. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Should I forgive as many as seven times? Jesus said, not just seven times, but rather as many as 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, they brought to him a servant who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Because the servant didn't have enough to pay it back, the master ordered that he should be sold along with his wife and children and everything he had, and that the proceeds should be used as payment. But the servant fell down, kneeled before him and said, Please be patient with me, and I'll pay you back. The master had compassion on that servant, released him, and forgave the loan. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 coins. He grabbed him around the throat and said, Pay me back what you owe me. Then his fellow servant fell down and begged him, Be patient with me, and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he threw him into prison until he paid back his debt. When his fellow servants saw what happened, they were deeply offended. They came and told their master all that happened. His master called the first servant and said, you wicked servant, I gave you all that debt. I forgave you all that debt because you appealed to me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? His master was furious and handed him over to the guard responsible for punishing prisoners until he had paid the whole debt. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if you don't forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I invite the worship team to come up as we sing um, Mountain of God together. And if 
you would like, I invite you to stand and, and as we sing together. Most of us have heard the phrase, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Those words ring true for us on both accounts. We know what it's like to err, to make a mistake, to get angry, to disappoint another person. And in turn, I suspect we all know what it's like to receive the uh, erring humanity of someone else, to be the recipient of someone else's anger or careless words, thoughtless actions. We felt out, um, left out or snubbed or disappointed by friends or a neighbor or even the church at times. And some of us have been even more unfortunately directly hurt and abused emotionally, physically by the evil plots of others. And so while God forgives, we just get angry, as in the Bernstein Bear story. Our natural instinct is to retaliate, to get even, to strike back, to pay evil for evil. We want judgment and punishment. We want to settle the accounts. We want to keep score of how many times we've been wrong. We remember that. We have a, f a saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Uh, we should know better than getting hurt more than once. In the real world, maybe we forgive down the line one time, but no more. 
So like Peter in the story from the gospel today, we want to know really what's the statute of limitations on forgiveness? How many times do we really need to forgive another person? And Peter thinks he's being very uh, gracious and generous to suggest seven, seven times. I mean, after all, one who is a chronic um, person at making mistakes, inflicting pain on others, being a miserable person, should not get more than a couple of chances. Enough is enough. But Jesus' words here are outrageous, generous, not seven times, but seven, 77 times, or in some translations, 70 times seven. It's Jesus' way of saying, stop counting. Uh, no, the numbers aren't really that important. It's the most outrageous story ever. Then that Jesus goes on to tell this parable. So that those who heard this parable for the first time must have surely been smiling a little bit. It's so exaggerated. The story begins with a powerful king and a lowly servant. And this powerful, wealthy king wants to settle up on some accounts. And so he comes to this lowly servant who owes the boss somewhere in excess of a billion dollars. 10,000 talents, or piles of gold in Morgan's translation. 10,000 talents. And in my Bible at the bottom of the story, a little notation says that a talent was worth 15 years' wages. So you figure it out. How much is it? You do the math. Uh, say, take an average of $50,000 a year times 15 years to make up one talent. Uh, that's $750,000. And then take that one talent and multiply it by 10,000 talents, and you have $7.5 billion that this slave owes the king. It's a pile of money, and there's no way he can pay it back. And we wonder when we read the story, who's more foolish in the story? The, the king who kept giving money to the slave or the slave who kept wasting finally all this money? How would you ever do that? They both have some responsibility in this failed loan. But perhaps the lowly servant is weaker because as the story unfolds, the servant pleads with the boss, just give me a little more time and I'll pay it back. It's ridiculous. It's laughable. Most of us could work for a thousand years and we'd never have a billion dollars. As stories go, this story is far-fetched. One in their right mind would never lend that kind of money and you'd never be able to spend that kind of money. You'd never be able to waste it all. It's too dramatic and yet it's called a parable because we get a glimpse of something more in that story. Jesus tells it to make a point. The wealthy ruler, we see a, a little glimpse of God in this powerful king. Just look at all that God has given us. Everything. The world, life, breath, beauty and friendship, laughter and love and warmth and sunshine and rain to water the earth and trees and fields and grass and mountains and birds and beasts of the air. The life we have, friends, is priceless. As someone has said, we can never repay God for all that God has given us. But then watch us go, using it all up, living in the world, going our separate ways without so much as a thank you to God at times. We waste, we pollute, we, uh, we, we transgress, we harbor anger and bitterness in ourselves, we breathe in the violence of the world around us, and we miss the mark of God's best, loftiest intentions for how we ought to live. We're oblivious to our own privilege. And yet the good news of the gospel, the good news of the story, is that every day of our broken lives, God loves us. Every day of our broken lives, when we waste and we get angry, God forgives us. As far as east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. 
The clumsy slave in the parable pleads for more time, just a little bit more time and I'll pay it all back. And the king in the story cancels the debt, just forgives it. You don't have to pay it back. The debt is canceled, a billion dollars just like that, gone. Surely God's grace is beyond calculation. God doesn't keep score. Love so amazing, so divine, we sing, demands my life, my soul, my all. A lifetime of debt is canceled. But then what happens next really disturbs us, right? Because the servant who's just been canceled this billion dollar debt promptly goes out and jails the neighbor for lunch money, pocket change. How ungrateful. Fresh from being forgiven this huge amount of money, the unforgiving servant arrests the neighbor and puts the neighbor in prison. How can that happen? After being forgiven such a great sum of money, how could he do this? Hasn't this lowly slave learned anything from the generous boss? But then the tables are turned and maybe we again see ourselves as those who keep score. We struggle because we get angry. We struggle with forgiveness. We calculate the failings of others around us. We, we fail to see all that God has given us by grace and all the opportunities that we have and all the time God forgave us again and again and we instead focus on the blunders of those around us. We are in turn to extend the same grace that's been given to us, but it's hard. It is a story of outrageous forgiveness the good news of the gospel. Now we should be quick to say that Jesus isn't intending any of us to stay in situations of harm or repeated abuse or where we're being taken advantage of by others or where our money and our resources are being swindled away by those around us, not at all. Before we can even begin to take Jesus seriously, we need to be safe from harm. But surely, Jesus, in this outrageous call to work at forgiveness, wants to provide us in our world with an alternative to retaliation, an alternative to punishment, to break the cycle of violence with this outrageous notion of forgiveness. What we see modeled so clearly in the life of Jesus on the cross and in his life is this refusing to fight back refusing to keep score, refusing to limit God's grace, and instead saying, even to those who harmed him, I, I, Father, forgive them, for they have no idea what they're doing. Indeed, those who have taken this journey will tell us that it's not an easy journey, forgiveness. Forgiveness is not short, not quick, not for the faint of heart. It is, as one person said, the most difficult act of love. And it's not pretending that evil doesn't exist or that the evil never happened. It doesn't condone or excuse the evil. It doesn't pardon the offender from dealing with the consequences of that evil and that sin. And certainly it doesn't always lead to a right relationship. It doesn't always lead to reconciliation. Five years ago, a young white man entered the doors of the Bethel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina and killed nine black followers of this same outrageous Jesus. And in a day or two after that tragic, horrific incident, one of the family members, a church leader, stood up and said again those outrageous words, we forgive him. It didn't stop the pain didn't stop that young man from dealing with the consequences of his actions, but it unhooked them a little bit from that violent cycle of vengeance and retaliation. Friends, this outrageous story is our story. It's not about someone else out there, and it's not about allowing people to keep hurting us or doing harm to others. We should expect in our forgiveness that that would be met with 
change and repentance and reconciliation. But it still comes back to us. Ultimately, how are we living in light of all the grace and the outrageous generosity of our loving God, recognizing how much we've been given, recognizing how much we've been forgiven, and then sh finding ways to share that dramatic, outrageous forgiveness to those around us. May God help us to that end. Amen. For our song of response, we'll sing about that grace that we've been given. I invite you to stand with us, whether in body or spirit, as we sing, Your Grace is Enough. We come now to our sharing time and announcements and prayer time. If you have a, a short word, you can stand where you're at and share it. I'll try to listen and summarize. And if you have a longer word you'd like to share with us, I, I think we can move this mic down um, and you can come um, and share a word with the church or announcement. 
Just want to recognize a special day for a couple in our congregation, Janet and Steve Panning, are celebrating their 40th anniversary today. <laughs> 40 years of uh, practicing forgiveness and uh, love and grace. And we're grateful that you are celebrating with all of us today. And may God continue to bless your marriage and your family. Also, um, just a couple of announcements as well. Um, we'll be starting um, a study on racism on Wednesday evening this week at seven o'clock by Zoom. And uh, if you'd like to sign up, uh, you can let the church know. We'll send the link out. Actually, the link will be the same link we've been using for the Tuesday evening uh, sharing devotional times. Uh, you can click on that link. That link is, comes with the bulletin on Thursdays or Fridays. Also, uh, it doesn't appear that we'll be gathering for in-person Sunday school in the fall and probably the winter, unfortunately. But we do want to have some Zoom Bible studies as well. We're blessed as a congregation with gifted teachers. And um, so... We'd like to transition our Tuesday evening kind of sharing devotional time into a, a shorter devotional or a, a shorter sharing time and a longer kind of block of Bible study following the regular Sunday school lessons. And we'll be doing that in the next couple of weeks on Tuesdays. And again, that link will, will be coming now just once on the Thursday, Friday bulletin email. It'll be the same link from week to week. And hopefully that's clear. Please let us know if you have any questions around any of that. Happy to help. Um, and we also want to remember uh, Hubert and Mary Schwarzentrooper. Hubert has a uh, surgery tomorrow at Grandview Hospital and uh, will probably be in overnight. Hopes to return home on Tuesday. We want to continue to remember Wilbur and Karen as Karen gets physical therapy uh, at Elm Terrace. Gardens. Are there other announcements or sharing? Lorraine, a word about next Sunday. I, I appreciate you putting the mic down so I don't have to embarrass myself by walking up these steps. And because I have a longer word I am part of the committee that has planned this church retreat, which is happening next Sunday at Camp Meadowland. I'm not sure how many years we have gone to Camp Meadowland for the retreat, but I do remember, I think, the first retreat, and it was not at Camp Meadowland, and that was planned by the then pastor, Paul Ledrock. Um, and it was a good time. We always have a good time at Camp Meadowland, and I hope to see you all there. If you haven't signed up, you can call me and let me know. We'll still make some accommodations for you. But I have a few instructions. Camp Menoland is requiring all of us to sign a COVID release form, which you will do when you come to camp. We're starting at nine, we'll be there at nine. You don't have to come at nine, but we as a committee are planning to do some coffee and munchkins. If the children wanna participate in the fishing derby as we always have had a fishing derby for many years, they need to bring a fishing rod. We will not be using any of the camp's fishing rod. You need to bring your own fishing rod. And as we meet here, we wear masks and we do some social, some physical distancing. We are going to do that up there. Our worship service will be outside and it probably will be near the auditorium where we do our worship. So 
hopefully it, it won't be hard walking in that area. I think our meal will also be outside and they will be serving it. Um, and I think there might be some regulations as to hand sanitizers and the use in the bathroom, but that will be posted up there. So I thank you for coming. If you didn't sign up or if you didn't pay, remember to do that. And if you want to sign up yet, let me know and we'll, we'll accommodate you. And come with a good spirit, a good attitude, and wanting to worship with the God who loves us and the God who forgives us even when we make a mistake. Oh, Karen says, Karen says we're planning on live streaming it, but that means you can still come. But we'll, we'll send a link out where you can click at 1015 if you're not able to come and you want to watch it live. Uh, you can watch the video live. It'll be a first trial run. Uh, Kieran has been experimenting over the weekend with that piece of technology. So uh, yeah, a little forgiveness along the way, right, Karen? But at the same time, I, I, I'm confident in uh, what uh, Karen, Bud, Oliver um, can do. Uh, if you're not able to watch it live, it will also be posted, and it will be saved and posted so that you can watch it later as well. Wilbur. Thank you, Wilbur, uh, offering a thanks from Karen for phone calls and prayers and cards, saying it'll be one to three weeks or so of physical therapy. But I'm sure she's working hard and pressing through pain as well, as I understand. Jim. I'm going to put something up here on the window. And I'd like to invite you to take a photo of it with your phone. Now, I don't know the total backstory on this. Maybe Governor Wolf has been asking to be at being sorry for a long time, but he had been ordered to shut down the Burks facility in Leesport where they are keeping families, keeping children, keeping children separate from their parents. This is an immigration ICE facility. And I'm inviting you to make a call using these phone numbers this Wednesday. So I'll bring this sheet with me and show it on Tuesday night Zoom again. But I'm inviting you to make a phone call to Governor Wolf and the PA Department of Health and Services this Wednesday and ask them to shut down the Burks Ice facility where they are just separating the families who come into this country. If you have more questions, ask me, or go on the website. There are three websites listed here. You can de definitely find all the information you need to know. I will tell you more stories about an organization that I joined, Immigration Rights Action Group. I, I think it's a great organization to be a part of. I'll talk, talk to you about that Tuesday night Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, uh, for calling our attention to the, uh, in, the uh, detention center in Berks County. And uh, for those interested to call Governor Wolf and make an appeal to close that facility. Other prayer requests or sharing? Let us come to God in prayer at this time. Oh God, we gather with our friends, your people, this morning to worship you, the one who has given us so much, the very world in which we live, and blessed us with countless spiritual and material blessings for rain and sunshine, shade trees and gardens, for sandy beaches, for work and for rest, for opportunities to play and gather with family and friends, 
even with our masks and our limitations, we give you thanks this morning, O God. Above all, Lord, we thank you for your abiding love, your constant presence, your gracious forgiveness coming into our lives again and again and again. We are grateful for your presence walking with your people through the wilderness and rebellion, times of grumbling and complaining, for your abiding presence in disaster and disobedience, in good times and bad, you offer second chances, new beginnings, mercy and redemption again and again and again. We long, O oh Lord, to be as gracious and forgiving as you, but we confess this morning how easily annoyed and bothered we are when other people fail to meet our expectations. We remember too often hurts for longer than we should. We hold grudges and allow our anger and rage to fester in our souls and spirits. Renew us, O oh Lord, redeem us. Remind us again of your mercy, of your love. Bless our friends and our family and bless even those who persecute, who hurt, who seek to destroy us. We invite your presence to bless those among us like Janet and Steve celebrating their 40th anniversary today. We lift up Karen Leidick and her ongoing physical therapy, giving thanks for the community of support around Wilbur and Karen. We pray for Hubert and for Mary as Hubert has his procedure tomorrow, for Mary Ann Voros, for Randy Arnold, for others in our church family and community who need a special touch of your presence and your love. We lift up the leaders of our country and state and county in these unusual times. Fill them with compassion, with fairness, with truth and justice for the oppressed. Give us the wisdom and courage and clarity in this election season. Be near to those in our world in the midst of natural disasters, especially those suffering loss due to these wildfires out west. Fill us with hope, O oh Lord. Bless your church, and especially today, the special ministries that we're supposed to lift up. We pray for PPMI and their ministry in India and Paulus and Sumata's leadership there. We remember the work of Mennonite Mission Network, especially their ministry in Lebanon and schooling and theological training. We pray for our congregation this week, for our, our church retreat on Sunday. May this time be blessed with your presence and your love. Send us forth now, O Lord, to be as gracious and outrageous in our forgiveness with others as you have been with us. Go with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think I did fail to recognize one person new here today for the first time, at least one. That'd be Esme Swartley, along with her parents, um, Zach and Anya, welcome. Friends, with the reminder of how much we have been forgiven by the grace of God, may we go forth from here extending that same grace to our brothers and sisters. Be in harmony with each other and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>